The Twin Towers, or the World Trade Center, had been a significant fixture in downtown Manhattan since opening for business in the 1970s. The concept for this center goes all the way back to a temporary incarnation at the 1939 World's Fair in Queens. Once placed under the purview of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the World Trade Center's construction started with a messy legal battle as to build these towers, an otherwise thriving sector of the city needed to be raised. As we know today, it ended with two innovatively designed 110-story towers that stole the Empire State Building's title of the tallest building in the world. The World Trade Center was, true to its name, one of the most prominent locations for global trade and business, not to mention it was a significant force for globalization and economic cooperation between countries. Even after it was destroyed in the tragedy of 9-11, an organization was immediately funded to redesign and rebuild the World Trade Center. The new buildings are standing, and the new World Trade Center is almost complete. And as the memory of these great towers fade, many people are forgetting their significance as architectural marvels. Well, that all changes right now, because today we discover the history of the World Trade Center. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's start our story with the very first iteration of the World Trade Center, which was created all the way back in 1939. Believe it or not, the origin of the World Trade Center emerged in a temporary pavilion at the 1939 World's Fair in Queens, dedicated to the concept of world peace through world trade. The World Trade Center was meant to be a neutral space for world business leaders to come together and collaborate. The initial World Trade Center in 1939 served as a headquarters for students and trade groups passing through while it was up. It inspired the World Trade Center, later developed in Lower Manhattan. And in case you didn't realize, even back then, Lower Manhattan was the largest central business district in America through the 1940s. However, it began losing businesses through the 1950s and 60s to Midtown Manhattan. The areas near Park Street were shinier and newer, whereas downtown had a more congested, cluttered street design and a gradually deteriorating waterfront in light of the decline of the steamship. On top of all that, the ports needed to be bigger or deeper for bigger freight ships, which simply exacerbated the problem when it came to naval trade and business. Hence, the vice president of Chase Manhattan Bank, David Rockefeller, founded the Downtown Lower Manhattan Association in 1958. Its purpose was to bring in business and revitalize Lower Manhattan. Shortly after its founding, they commissioned architectural firm Skidmore Owings & Merrill to design and build a Lower Manhattan site. The site was to be 13.5 acres. It would include a 70-story hotel and office building, central security buildings, and perhaps most importantly, it would feature an international trade hall and exhibition center, otherwise known as a World Trade Center, as the plan's main attraction. This new, more permanent World Trade Center was intended to provide a big jumpstart to promote business development, not only in Manhattan, but internationally. It was also meant to stand as a symbol of the United States as a leader in the international business community. The original site was proposed between Old Slip Street and Fulton Street on the East River. However, the planning and building were handed over to be managed by the Port Authority, which moved the site over to the west of Lower Manhattan to strengthen ties between New York and New Jersey. The Port Authority received authorization to build on that site in 1962, but with the official birth of this new megastructure would come the death of Radio Row. The western area of the land on which the World Trade Center was meant to be built was originally under the Hudson River. In the past, the shoreline was near Greenwich Street, near the eastern border of the World Trade Center site. And this area was rather historic, as the land contained the wreckage of a ship belonging to Dutch explorer Adrian Block that burnt up and sank in 1613. The incident forced Block and his crew to spend the winter on shore, leading them to found the first European settlement in Manhattan. When the shoreline began to extend in 1797, the ship's remains were buried under a landfill until they were rediscovered in 1916. But even in relatively modern times, the area was important to New York. 
You see, this area was a warehouse district until the electronics shop City Radio opened on Cortland Street in 1921. Electronics stores began sprouting around it for several blocks, and the area became known as Radio Row. At its peak, Radio Row was home to over 300 businesses, and there were supposedly piles of products and parts so high that they spilled out onto the streets. But this scenario wouldn't go on forever, as the Port Authority's proposed building location for the World Trade Center was smack dab right in the middle of Radio Row. Naturally, the local business owners protested the move being forced onto them in a court case that went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court dismissed the business's claims in November of 1963. It gave free reign to the Port Authority, which fully used the powers of eminent domain. In other words, powers that allow the government to seize land by force if it's meant for public service, and the Port Authority used that justification to evict all of the businesses from Radio Row. And so it was. The row was raised in 1966 to clear 16 acres of land for the World Trade Center. Now, the next chapter is going to showcase some rather impactful events. But before we go there, I wanted to thank you all for supporting the channel. Putting my name out there has been amazing. However, there has been a bit of a, let's say, dark side behind the scenes concerning personal privacy. What I didn't realize before making these videos was that my digital footprint contained lots of information that I didn't want in the hands of strangers. This is an issue that most of us can relate to, even if you don't make YouTube videos. But thanks to the sponsor of this video, Delete Me, you now have the power to make yourself more private. Delete Me is a very cool service that will basically erase you from the internet. I'm talking about hundreds of data broker websites that have no business selling your information, and it's an ongoing process. Once they clean house, they'll keep scanning for new data that shows up so they can remove that also. So how does it work? Well, Delete Me searches all the top data broker websites, and on average, they find and remove over 2,000 pieces of personal data for a customer in their first two years. To date, they've removed over 100 million pieces of data for their customers. Thanks to Delete Me, I could remove old listings containing my vital records like former addresses and professional background. I even managed to get rid of some family photos. And with Delete Me's ongoing monitoring, I feel confident that I can continue enjoying the privacy everyone deserves. I'd encourage you to do the same. So if you want to get your personal information removed from search results on the web, go to joindeleteme.com slash SoCash. Delete Me is offering 20% off their privacy plans to all my viewers with my special code, SoCash. Again, that's joindeleteme.com slash SoCash, promo code SoCash. Again, thank you all so much for supporting the channel. And now, back to the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center's final design was unveiled in 1964 by the new lead architect, Minoru Yamasaki. When the project was first announced, it was supposed to be a complex consisting of one 70-story tower with several smaller buildings surrounding it. But by 1964, the scope had grown. The new World Trade Center complex, containing almost 10 million square feet of office space, would boast two 110-story towers, four smaller buildings surrounding them, and a seventh building added to the north in the 1980s. Construction began in 1966, but it wouldn't be easy. As mentioned earlier, the towers were mostly built on landfill, and hence the foundations had to be dug to reach bedrock 70 feet below street level. The complex's construction required over 400 and 25,000 cubic yards of concrete and over 200,000 tons of steel from at least seven different foundries. The towers were getting built up beyond ground level in 1968, with the North Tower topped off by 1970 at a whopping 1,368 feet tall. The transmission tower and accompanying antennas built on top of the towers added another 360 feet of height. The South Tower was topped off in 1971 at an altitude of 1,362 feet. This building was massive. Each floor of each tower was roughly an acre large. They were built using a hollow tube building model, meaning the towers had a load-bearing exterior of tight steel columns. 
They also had a rectangular inner core that distributed weight to the exterior columns across floor trusses. The more flexible surface allowed for the towers to brace against the wind. Each building could sway up to a foot from side to side on exceptionally windy days. For vertical transportation, there were an astonishing 198 total elevators. The Twin Towers were very innovative. In fact, they were among the first skyscrapers to use alternating local and express elevators. The express elevators had a passenger capacity of 55 adults, driven by the largest elevator motors in the world when installed. There were also 43,000 600 windows, and that was enough that it took 20 days to wash all of them. Tenants started moving into the North Tower after it was topped off in 1970, with the World Trade Center complex officially being dedicated in 1973. At the time they were completed, they were the tallest buildings in the world, and you wouldn't believe just how much was contained within them. Restrooms, stairwells, utility and elevator shafts, and other spaces needed for the building's support were within each of the tower's rectangular core. There were also sky lobbies on each tower's 44th and 78th floor. These were spaces to switch between local and express elevators, an innovation that saved room and resources that would have otherwise been used making up the elevator banks. A concept in part based on inspiration from the New York subway system. The hollow tube design and the saved space from the sky lounges allowed for the towers to have an open floor plan as well, a feature of great importance to the designer. The buildings also featured underground car parking with a capacity of 2,000. There were also floors dedicated to keeping the towers up and running, including the 7th and 8th floors, the top two floors, and the two floors below each sky lobby were fully dedicated to maintenance, technological services, and utilities. Outside, around the tower, there was a five-acre plaza named the Austin J. Tobin Plaza in 1983 after a deceased chairman of the Port Authority. This area featured a portable stage in the summer set up right against the North Tower. Each year, events were hosted called Center Stage at the World Trade Center. There was a sculpture called the Sphere and a fountain in the plaza center. There were also several other statues, including a memorial fountain for the terrorist bombings against the towers in 1993, but more on that in a moment. The South Tower had an observation deck enclosed in glass on the 107th floor and an open air deck on the 110th floor. These viewing areas were called the top of the world and were one of the few areas in the World Trade Center open to the public. The top of the world had video monitors describing points of interest throughout the city, a simulator depicting a helicopter ride over Manhattan, and a model of Manhattan with 750 buildings. Then there was the windows to the World Restaurant on the 106th and 107th floors of the North Tower. It opened in 1976 and spawned a few offshoots at the top of the North Tower. Regrettably, the windows on the World Restaurant closed after the attack in 1993, but ultimately it reopened in 96, having sold its offshoots to different companies. In the restaurant's last year of operation, in 2000, it was the highest grossing restaurant in America. There were other buildings in the World Trade Center complex too, such as the Vista Hotel, the Marriott World Trade Center, the United States Customs Service, the US Commodities Exchange, and so on. And perhaps mysteriously, there were also basement vaults under the towers that were home to one of the largest gold depositories in the entire world. Within the towers were many food courts, offices, and other spaces needed to house all of the federal, state, and city companies that were tenants of the World Trade Center. The companies renting space were banks, brokers, trade associates, and agencies. Indeed, making the World Trade Center in Manhattan a hub of financial transactions and globalization. Several significant events occurred at the World Trade Center while it was still standing. On August the 7th, 1974, Highwire artist Philip Petit did an unauthorized Highwire walk between the North and South Towers, 1,300 feet above ground. To accomplish this, he made over 200 trips over the course of three months to plan the event. The Daredevil, along with several friends, began sneaking up a few days ahead to set up all of the equipment in the dead of night. 
The stuntman claimed to have done it just because the towers were there, so he had to perform on the stage provided to him. He performed for 45 minutes and did eight rounds before he turned himself into the police. And surprisingly, he was released in exchange for entertaining children in Central Park. As just a few months earlier, in July, Owen Quinn performed an unauthorized parachute jump from the top of the North Tower. At least four other people followed his example between 1980 and 1999. And although many very positive events unfolded at the World Trade Center, disaster would ultimately overshadow their legacy, marking dark headlines much earlier than most of us would realize. On February the 13th, 1975, a three-alarm fire started on the 11th floor of the North Tower. It spread to the 9th and 14th floors through telephone cables. The World Trade Center had no fire sprinkler system yet, hence the fire was extinguished only within a few hours, and most of the damage was concentrated on the 11th floor. The steel columns were fireproofed and the tower sustained no structural damage, but as a result, sprinklers were installed several years later. Then, on February the 26th, 1993, the World Trade Center faced its first terrorist attack. A truck filled with explosives blew up the North Tower's parking garage. The blast tore a 100-foot hole through five floors, killing six people and injuring 6,042 more. Seven men were ultimately convicted of their contribution to the bombing, whose intention was widely believed to have been to make the North Tower topple and crash into the South. But this wouldn't be the end of hard times. On January the 14th, 1998, the World Trade Center was victim to a robbery. Mafia member Ralph Garino masterminded a three-man heist and stole roughly $2 million from a delivery to the North Tower's 11th floor. As intense as these incidents all were, the turn of the 21st century would bring something much worse. It would bring the beginning of the end. The towers of the World Trade Center were destroyed on September the 11th, 2001, in one of the most famous tragedies in American history. Al-Qaeda, a terrorist organization headed by Osama bin Laden, hijacked an American Airlines flight and crashed into the North Tower. A second team crashed a United Airlines flight into the South Tower just several minutes later. The crashes blocked off the stairwells and took out several elevators, trapping hundreds of people on the upper floors to die. The entire World Trade Center complex took heavy damages and was eventually destroyed by the debris. The death toll was catastrophic. Even immediately after the attack, the news suggested tens of thousands of casualties. As of 2005, 2,749 death certificates had been filed for the 9-11 attacks, with only a little over half forensically identified. The emergency services that rushed in to provide aid also confirmed hundreds of deaths, although there were some examples of courageous survivors. On the day following the attacks, 11 people were rescued from the rubble, including six firefighters and three other police officers. One woman was rescued from the rubble near where the West Side Highway pedestrian bridge had been. Two officers, John McLaughlin and Will Jamino, were also rescued. As former U.S. Marines Jason Thomas and Dave Cranes pulled them out after spending nearly 24 hours beneath 30 feet of rubble. Their rescue was later portrayed in the Oliver Stone film, World Trade Center. In total, 20 survivors were pulled out of the rubble. The final survivor was secretary to the Port Authority and had been rescued 27 hours after the collapse of the North Tower. Some firefighters and civilians who survived made phone calls from the voids beneath the rubble, and although their presence was acknowledged, the amount of debris made it difficult for rescue workers to get to them. The rubble continued to smoke for over 90 days afterwards, which shocked me personally when I visited Ground Zero about two weeks after this disaster. In fact, there were two things I wasn't prepared for, this distinct and very disturbing smell of the smoke but also the vast scale of the area that was destroyed. I'd be curious here if any of you watching have your own experiences to share from the World Trade Center. New York spent the next eight and a half months running a 24-hour cleanup with thousands of workers clearing debris, much of which was sent across America in memorial. The remains of the World Trade Center can now be found in all 50 states and all over the world. 
Over 2,500 artifacts collected from the attack site were kept in hangar number 17 of John F. Kennedy International Airport by the Port Authority, who started a program in 2010 to send out these pieces to more than 1,000 different places to remember the lives lost. Many of the remains of the World Trade Center towers are now displayed as part of memorials to the events of September the 11th. New York, New Jersey, and California have the largest shares of the remains. None of this is to say that the World Trade Center is gone for good. The Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, or LMDC, was established in November of 2001 to oversee the rebuilding process. The LMDC organized a public competition for a new site plan and designs for a memorial. Daniel Libeskind's Memorial Foundation design was selected, albeit with some significant modifications. The center of the innovation is One World Trade Center, nicknamed Freedom Tower by the governor. The first new building, Seven World Trade Center, was completed and opened in May of 2006. The National September 11th Memorial and Museum opened its memorial section on the attack's 10th anniversary and its museum section in May of 2014. With the museum opening just one week prior to victims' families, one World Trade Center itself opened for business in November of 2014 and opened its observation deck that following May. Then we have the new World Trade Center Transportation Hub, the Oculus, which was completed in 2016, and three World Trade Center in 2018. As of 2018, the two and five World Trade Center buildings have yet to finish construction. The idea of the World Trade Center was first designed as a way to bring the world together through business and trade. When the complex was built in Lower Manhattan, it revitalized the local economy and kept the neighborhood from fading into obscurity. During the original structure's time up and running, although the towers were only partially booked up, they still housed several major agencies for banks, tradings, and exports, among other things. Well, the plan worked. Remember those high death toll estimates I mentioned from 9-11? Well, those numbers were based on the fact that over 500,000 people could be found working in the World Trade Center on a single day, on their way to and from work, with even more passing through the mall and transportation center directly beneath it. Even the look of the towers was an integral part of the New York City skyline since they first went up. The World Trade Center was doing its job and bringing people together. But it's not done yet. Even after the Twin Towers were torn down, reconstruction started immediately. The new structures are going up, and before you know it, Freedom Tower, the new face of the World Trade Center, will be bringing different parts of the globe together all over again, which in my humble opinion is the very essence of New York City.